like this. You see, you get that. That makes it longer. Oh, yeah. We can put this a bit. Or I can sit here. Monita, you could get a really good picture right here. Okay. Or, Marius, would you mind sitting there for a second? Yeah. Yeah, there's better light there. It's more light, but yeah. that doesn't say it's better. I don't know what you... Uh, it, looks, it, looks. it looks better over there. Yeah, I think it's a bit shadow. This is too much light for film. You have also need a bit there. Uh, yeah. Shadow. Okay, Bonita, if you sit right here, it's already filming. <coughs> and um, you can see this is the picture. Right, right. It's filming right now. Watch right. the numbers going. Right. So just don't push anything down on the no, side. No, 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 no. <coughs> and hopefully the volume. What will is be your up. name? Because then I... <laughs> My name is Marcy. Marty. Marcy. Marcy. <laughs> Marcy. Yeah, it's okay. I can speak to you as Marcy. Right. Right. Okay. okay. So, um, I don't know how to sit on these things because I'm no, short. Oh, yeah, you're a bit short. Yeah. yeah. I have to do what to. Okay. So, <coughs> um, so, I'll just start by telling you who I am. Um, my name is Marcella Parrott. I um, actually, I don't want to say that. I'll delete that out. Okay. Um, go ahead. You could sit on the floor. No, but then you get only light. <laughs> and I'm Dr. Marcella Parrott interviewing Dr. Marius Ram from the Netherlands on October 21st of 2016. And I'm pleased to meet you. And thank you so much for speaking with me. We are at the Congress, the Hearing Voices Network Congress in Paris. And um, I'm delighted to speak with you. I wanted to ask you a few questions about um, Basically, who you are, and if you could tell me just a little bit about yourself and how you got started in this business. I know that you're the grandfather of all of this, so could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm Marius Roma, that you said already, and I've been a professor of psychiatry in the university at the University of Maastricht, and I've been that there since 1974. And I've got pensioned in 2000. So uh, in that the latest years, and now about 25, 30 years nearly, we have Sandra, Escher and me together have done research into the experience of hearing voices. <coughs> so what people experience when they hear voices and the differentiation. And we compared in those studies the patient who became patients with their voices because they were hindering and or giving trouble and uh, non-patients that is healthy people who hear voices but are inspired by them can cope well and not dominated by them so those two groups we, because in the beginning we discovered after a talk show on television <coughs> we did that talk show because a patient of mine, Patsy, wanted to know how to cope with her voices, and I didn't know anything. And I realized that psychiatry doesn't know much about the experience of hearing voices because they see it just as a symptom of an illness, and that is a very poor view of voices because voices that in the research came out to have meaning in the life of the, of the person who hears them. They are related to what has happened and mostly are also related to the emotions involved in what has happened oh. in the lives of the people. So hearing voices is more a reaction to in patients to problematic, traumatic situations or problematic sexual identities, that's also possible. Anyhow, a psychological problem which with emotions involved. And that is what the voices express. And that is also what people feel when they hear voices, they mo their emotional reaction is an emotional they can't easily cope with. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we just gradually became to know more and more of voices until we had, because the, until we said in 2013, 
And that was also the idea of the Hearing Voices movement, which came forward from our research, because the people were helped by this different approach. But then it was understandable that it was a reaction to what they had suffered or anyhow had encountered in their lives. While well, psychiatry made it a distant illness, which you are twice traumatized, by denial and by medication, which doesn't help against the voices, only reduce emotions. Mm -hmm. So then you get in a difficult situation. You have an emotional problem and they give you a medicine against emotion, so you never learn to cope neither with your emotions, neither with your voices. And that is why we are happy that uh, voice hearers are really profited and that was also the reason the hearing voices movement <coughs> grows and is now on itself and grows by hearing voices groups like you have organized in your district I think. Yes, and I that's have. very important that there are more people in who hear voices in this possibility yes. to learn to cope with their emotions and to learn to cope with their voices because they better learn to understand their voices, what they mean when they say ugly things. They don't all mean always ugly things, but they warn you that often. So when somebody says, when a voice says, you could as well be dead, it doesn't mean that you should suicide yourself, but mostly they say that in a situation but they think you should do something about your life because otherwise it never, or you never will solve the problem. So they, but they are talking in black and white way and they are talking in more metaphorical way. Right. Not straightforward saying do this or that, but they, straight, they give a kind of an idea about what you should do. Or May I ask you a couple of clinical yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, I know that throughout your career you've used um, or you developed an exam called the, is it the Maastricht exam? No, or it's not an exam. We interview, we developed a interview, interview about all the details of voices and we developed that on the basis of what voiceers told us and voiceers found relevant in the oh. beginning. We met in the after this talk show. We met quite a lot of voices. They were reacting uh, to the talk show, and they wanted to be involved. And we invited them for the first congress of hearing voices. That was, in fact, the start of the movement, you could say. But that was just a strange idea about uh, from us. But Sandra Escher thought, when you want to have a talk show, you have to have news. So the news was to organize the first hearing voices conference that have ever been organized. Yeah. So that became, then it becomes interesting for the television. And Sandra and Betsy told her story and asked if somebody could help her because she didn't know how to cope. And we thought, I thought, there must be somebody in this world who know her because she knew so many details about her voices that it is a real experience. So. Why shouldn't other people? And then it came out that there are quite a lot of people who know to cope with it. And I told them that the psychiatry had no solution for it. That's why I asked about the exam, because, or um, <coughs> but in interview, because I read that interview and I took the interview, uh, I took it myself, and I wondered if psychiatrists in the United States approach things very differently than the psychiatrists <laughs> in Europe, oh. and very differently. Oh. If you hear voices, chances are you're going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah, in Holland too. Yeah, I am too. a bit a special psychiatrist, that's the thing. Right, okay, right. This and is so norm, not normal psychiatry in Holland. No. No, 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 I'm an exception in that sense, because I just listened to the patient and thought, hey, she needs to be helped with coping with her voices. And that's why I became um, a person that people could go to to uh, be heard and have group yeah. and therapy and things like that. But there, I realized there was no place for people to go or no one to listen to. Um, I myself am a voice hearer yeah. and tried to find help and there was nowhere to go. Yeah. 
so then once I realized there was no place for me to go, I decided I would like to find some clinical research or something I could bring to psychiatrists, perhaps. And I found that the Maastricht um, <coughs> interview, and I thought maybe this is something I could provide to psychiatrists. And then I thought, well, there's, I couldn't find any way to evaluate it to give to the psychiatrist. And so I thought, well, maybe I could ask you, know, um, you how, if it would be a helpful tool for psychiatrists to use um, for their voice hearing patients, and is there a, a way for them to evaluate the results they get from, from the uh, tool? Yeah, <clears throat> the problem in this case is that psychiatrists are trained differently they are trained not to go into the experience of hearing voices. So then you offer something they are trained not to do. That's one thing to overcome. But you would have psychiatrists because they know they don't do, they have nothing, not much to offer with voices because medication doesn't help against the voices, it just lowers the emotions make more. And that's been my experience that, as well. Yeah. That is the normal psychiatric reaction, so it's good to bring them the interview, but you have to realize that they have to overcome some barriers, because the barrier one is that they have to accept the person really hears voices. A lot of psychiatrists do not really accept that, but just think it is a psychotic, and psychotic simply means it has no meaning. It's just a bit of a nonsense, a chaotic way of thinking. Is, yeah psychosis but it's not it is there are more people hearing voices who can cope with them and there are people who become patient with them so for them it's different for at first to listen it's difficult to um, to step down from the idea that it uh, is a psychotic symptom it's not a psychotic symptom it's even a symptom with meaning in the life so it is a reaction to what traumatic events or psychological problems. It is an understandable reaction, but then you know, have to know the tools like the master interview, because they don't even know otherwise what to ask. And when they know what to ask, then they have to make an organize the information to organize the information, because if you interview somebody, he will tell lots of things, but then you have to go back to the uh, interview and say, I, I make a report and that means I make in every item of the 13 just only that information that's asked in that item. So you get organized information. And to make the relationship between the life history and what has happened, you need organized information. And most voiceers don't know what this relationship is really not in the beginning. So they don't they give don't give you a well organized information. They just give you what is coming in their what is most important in their experience. But that is not a systematic overview. So other than facilitation, where does one get training on voice hearers and where, where does one get information and training on how to have best help the voice hearer? Now, where well, there's no train, <coughs> there are in the America, like you have been trained to facilitate a group. And in that training, you will have heard about our approach of hearing voices, and so you have some information. But there's no training uh, how to, uh, what is the best way to. Voice dialoguing and things for, like that. Yes, that, there's no, for dialogue is one of the possibilities. The interview is not systematically trained in the, yeah, you know, in the America, in the USA, in the USA, there is a training on what you have had on facilitating groups. But there's no training that should be organized. But in the American USA, it's only shortly that you have been coming enthusiastic and do quite a lot of things. But there's no systematic training in the, there to... Uh, so someone like me who wants to actually learn about it would have to go to Europe? I think, yeah, or you have to invite one of the, our trainers to come. To, to come to psychiatrists. 
but uh, because I would, it would be nice if we could have a group of uh, people from the United States to train, to use the interview properly, you could say, and to know what to do with the information, yes. because that's important. And uh, Cerise Rosen from Chicago is interested. So you could take contact, make a small group, and come to Europe. It would be nice also to come to Europe. Yes. And then we could organize next year a, a, a course to get more knowledge about how to uh, deal with voices, how to yeah, uh, approach voices, and how to learn them to get in the beginning more control, to get less afraid of their voices, to learn to know the emotions they have troubles with, so that kind of thing. Um, one question that's of clinical importance that I think people need to know is, are there other um, diagnoses that have voices? Yeah, many, because uh, it was only in the DSM, that is this Bible for psychiatry, you could say, that's okay, but that is, um, <coughs> and that was first only uh, schizophrenia, but now they have taken that out, that you only, they had it in that if you hear voices long enough, then it was also a criterion for diagnosis, and that's not true, and that they have taken out, but um, there are many other uh, uh, illnesses or diagnoses because we see it with uh, dissociative disorders, dissociation uh, disorders, so as what in dissociation is called an alter ego, they call voices alter egos, but we call voices because we don't translate it into a professionalism, we just say what people hear is voices. They don't hear alter egos. And that is already a step to a professional way of interpreting. And then you see it with depressions, then you see it with uh, uh, borderline persons, because borderline persons have had, most of all have had a traumatic experience which they did not really come over. And that is when it is st stuck in your brain and comes out in the indirect way of the voices. So you have the voices in fact tell them about what has happened and how they could best cope with it, but it's difficult to, uh, to understand the voices. And therefore we have developed this instrument of the construct, the relationship between. But to make the concept, you first have to make an interview, then a report to get well organized, and then you use a number of items to know, to get information about what has happened in their life and how emotionally they have reacted to that. So that's for a course very well to do. We do that in Holland. But, uh, and uh, Peter Budimo is doing that in England and uh, uh, Joachim, uh, uh, Joachim does that in Germany. So uh, in France they don't have a course. and. Uh, in Spain, I don't know yet, uh, yeah. because uh, that was last year, it's coming up. And France, not yet, because they only recently started, in fact, last year, it's like, they have started about at the same time as in America. Well, I know that in America, now this, the spread of the HVN, the Hearing Voices Network, had started in the Netherlands, yeah. and then spread to the UK. Yeah. Is this correct? And then um, has spread throughout the world, which I think is one of the most amazing things. Yeah. And um, the U.S. Um, predominantly, predominantly started on the East Coast and then spread to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And then I received my training in San Francisco. And what I would like to see personally is more of a spread to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm hoping to get out of this is... Um, some education, obviously, and I would also like to get my trainer, who came from the West, or came from the East Coast, Carolyn White, to come out and do some trainings for some facilitators um, on the Central Coast of California, because 
we have about a hundred miles of coast um, where we only have one facilitator, that being myself, mm -hmm. and um, we desperately, four, nine, I can imagine. We desperately need education. Things. And I'm also working in a hospital where um, people are um, brought in, um, um, they're against, against their will, mm -hmm. and they are um, being let go, being voice hearers with nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, just like mm -hmm. myself, not have, you know, I looked in the phone book trying to find somebody, mm -hmm. you know, when I first started yeah. hearing voices, and there was no one. And um, there are so many voice hearers that I, I can't even tell you how many voice hearers there are, and there's nowhere for them to go. Yeah. And so my goal well, is... a lot of voice hearers. It's yeah. about 4%. About 4%. Yeah, this population. But most of them de don't need help. And it's about 1% that's uh, needing help. 1% needing help? <coughs> yeah. Is that after? But that's with group therapy, right? Or with some no, sort of... No, that depends on what is the background. That I depends mean, on the that background. That's personal. Yeah. You can make a diagnosis with this in this way. But the background, if it is sexual abuse, will need another kind of approach than being bullied over a long time. I mean, it's both trauma, but you can't just mix it up. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. one thing. People have experienced something which they, for them was very difficult. So I'd they like have people to, to be educated control. on voice yeah. hearing. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, I think, I think this is, now you're telling your own story, and that's very I nice, am. but we stopped then, I think. I think so too. Because your idea was to have an interview for your group. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. much. Okay.